Hello and happy Valentine's Day everyone. My name is Keith Cook. I am the new curator here at the 390 Memorial Museum. Today's a really special day for us here at the museum because we have our new next jacket rotation coming out. Now, because of Omicron, we couldn't have a big social event like we've been doing in the past, but we did want to make this a special, did want to mark this occasion, so we decided we'd give you a virtual tour, show you around, and let you see what jackets are going out on the floor. So the first one we have for you today is our resident enigma, the Liberty Bell. Now we call it an enigma because we actually don't know who this jacket belonged to. We searched through our own records, we even went out to you guys on social media to see if we could find that person or even find someone who knew that person, but no such luck. But with some of the information we have found on this jacket, we can we can make some educated guesses about who they were. First off, we knew that they flew aboard the Liberty Bell, which was an aircraft that was assigned to the 390th that was so badly damaged in early 1945 that it was eventually given up for scrap. And they flew 35 missions on that particular plane. There are 35 bombs on this jacket. Interesting thing about those bombs is that, they're, is that the way they're painted on mimics a bombing formation, the close, the combat box formation. You also notice that there are two, actually three, blue bombs on this jacket. We don't know why they were painted blue, but one thing that I do want to bring your attention to is this long one right here that has 35 painted onto it. That was the number of missions this person completed and that was the number of missions an airman needed to finish towards the end of the war before they could actually go home. At the start of the war, Initial people had to finish 25 missions, but as the war was progressing and the mortality rate started to drop, the higher-ups thought, okay, the guys are coming back from their missions more often, so we can ask our boys to fly more missions. So the fact that this last mission was so prominently displayed on this jacket kind of shows just how much it meant for this guy to be able to finish this combat tour, to get through all the craziness that was involved in, in that tour of duty, all the flack, all the terror, all the fear and finally be able to go home. On top of that bomb, you'll see this little symbol here. This is the symbol of the 8th Air Force, and this is featured prominently on a number of jackets. This next jacket here belonged to Henry J. Gerards, and he was the co-pilot for crew number 42 of the 570th Squadron. You can see their squadron patch right here. Now, Gerards was born in Kennewick, Washington in 1917, and was actually the youngest of eight children. Now, before the war, he actually worked for his older brother as a watchmaker in La Grande, Oregon, and was called into active service in 1944, and it was eventually assigned to the 390th Bomb Group. Now, Gerard's completed 22 combat missions between March and May of 1944. On his 23rd mission, his aircraft was shot down over Germany, and he was taken as a prisoner. And he was subsequently transferred to the Stalagluth prison camp near the town of Sagan, Germany, which is now modern-day Sagan, Poland. And during that time, Gerards wrote dozens of letters to his friends and family. Under international law at that time, the belligerent parties were expected to allow prisoners of war to write letters to their friends and family to let them know they were fine. It was also a way for prisoners of war to kind of stave off boredom while they were waiting for the war to end. And we have a number of those letters in our collection. A number of them were actually written to himself where he was reminding himself when he gets back to eat these certain foods, to drink these certain drinks. It was his way of saying, I'm going to get through this, I'm going to survive, and I'm going to get home. And he was among the thousands of prisoners marched out of the camp by the German guards in late January of 1945 and transferred from one camp to another as the Germans tried to keep ahead of the Red Army advancing into the East in 1945. Gerards and the other prisoners were eventually arrived at Stalag 7A near Musburg, Germany, where they stayed until the camp was liberated by the U.S. 14th Armored Division on April 29, 1945. After he got home, Gerards married his wife, Margaret Thompson, and returned to the watchmaking business. He eventually opened his own jewelry store, Gerards for Jewelry, in Pendleton, Oregon. And he was actually pretty successful in that industry. He actually ended up opening branch stores in Spokane, Washington, and Post Falls, Indiana. He died on February 29th, 2012, at the age of 95. Now, all the eye-catching details on this jacket you will find on the front. There's no art on the back. And if you take a close look at these patches, you'll see they're actually in really good condition. This is because Gerard's actually continued to wear this jacket after the war and continued to add things to his jacket. It was 
The thing you need to know about these A2 jackets is that they were a status symbol for the people that wore them. When you got it, it was basically a recognition that you were now an airman, you were now a bomb recruitment. So people were really excited to wear these. And we have stories of people wearing these even after the war until they fell apart. So just looking at all these things, you can see this jacket meant a lot to Gerard. So I already told you this was the 570 squadron patch right here. This right here is the 8th Air Force symbol again, like you saw on the Liberty Bell. Now this right here, these were Gerard's pilot wings. They essentially told anybody that saw them that he was a certified pilot with the United States Army Air Forces. Right below that, you see his official name tag, which has his first two initials and his last name, H.J. Gerard's. And coming over here, you can't really make it out too well, but I'm just gonna... On this side, there's the official 390th coat of arms, which says the 390th bomb group, the three bombers flying over the castle near Framlingham. So, it was, this is one of the cases, this is one of the two examples that we have in this set of people continuing to wear these jackets after the war. The third jacket we have for you is the Miss Q. This one belonged to Harold Vernon White, who was the co-pilot for crew number 89 of the 571st Squadron. Now, before I go into too much detail about this jacket, I want to give a special shout out to David White, Harold's son, who was willing to share with us some information about his father. You really helped fill in some holes for us. So we hope you find the time to come down here and check this out. We hope we do your father's story proud. So Harold was born in Waterton, New York in 1922 and was raised on a chicken farm near the St. Lawrence River. And he was very enthusiastic about serving his country after the attack on Pearl Harbor, but he didn't want to ask for his mother for permission to enlist. He didn't want her to feel responsible if something happened to him. So he waited until he turned 21 before he signed up. Now, when he was, now after being assigned to the 390th Bomb Group, he flew 35 combat missions between June and October of 1944. And after he was discharged, he went back to school and graduated from Clarkson University. The same year he got his degree, he married Flora Ann Scott. He then took a job at General Electric and later the International Business Machines Corporation, better known as IBM, and managed to get both his wife and their two children through Dartmouth, St. Lawrence, and Vassar Colleges. In the 60s, he bought a Cessna and got back into flying. And according to David, he would actually wrap his forearm around the back of the control yoke of his, of his plane during landing. Now, the reason why he did that was because he learned to do that back when he was flying B-17s. He did that when they were trying to bring the nose of the plane up when they were trying to land it. So White died in 2019, a year after his wife, and the couple were buried together in a cemetery overlooking the St. Lawrence River, that same river that White grew up next to. Now, let's take a look at some of the things on this jacket. The first thing I want to draw your attention to is this phrase, Miss Q. What does that mean? That is the name of Harold's plane, the plane that he flew aboard most frequently. Right below that, you see this series of bombs, 35 bombs, like the Liberty Bell. That was the number of missions that this individual flew. It was meant to denote, I came back, I finished these missions, I'm one step closer to finishing my tour of duty. Now, you can't really make this out here because the paint is flaked a lot, which is a big tragedy, but you can just make out the shape of a reclining figure here. Now, Based on what we know these guys would most frequently paint on their jackets, namely that they loved painting pinup girls on their jackets, we can make an educated guess that this was also a pinup girl. Jacket number four here belonged to James A. Welsenbach, who was an in-flight engineer and top turret gunner with the 570th Squadron. Again, you can see their patch right here. Now, an interesting story about that patch, as a side tangent, is this was the only officially approved emblem in the 390th bomb group. There was this competition that was held at the beginning of the war. This was actually submitted by one of the, um, the lead bombardiers in the group at the time. His, he had a background as a professional illustrator. He submitted it. It won the competition. It was officially recognized. It was the only one out of the official pa out of the four patches that was ever officially recognized. Now, some background about Welsenbach is that he was born in Baltimore, Maryland on May 8th, 1924, and worked at the Bethlehem Sparrows Point shipyard prior to his enlistment in April of 1943. 
He was assigned to the 390th Bomb Group in late 1944 and flew 34 combat missions between October of 1944 and March of 1945. And one of his favorite stories during that time in his life was that one of his English chauffeurs was actually then Princess Elizabeth, who you might know better today as the current Queen of the UK. Now I'm afraid we don't have many details about Welsenbach's life after the war. He was married twice, had two children with his first wife, and passed away on November 19th, 2012. This next jacket here belonged to George D. Hitchcock, who was the pilot for crew number 73 of the 570th Bomb Squadron. Now, we weren't actually able to find a whole lot of information about Hitchcock, apart from that he flew 27 Sardis between February and May of 1945, including three Chowhound missions. We also know that he flew quite a few of his missions aboard aircraft 338-521K, better known as Old Blood and Guts. If we look at the other side of this jacket, you see two things. The first is his official name tag right up there, which has his first two initials and his last name. The interesting thing about this one is that it actually also, is that it also has his rank on it, Lieutenant, which is the only one out of the 40 we have in our collection that actually does this. And right below that, you see a squadron patch. Again, you see the Jester of the 570th. The sixth jacket we have for you belonged to Roger P. Howell, who was a co-pilot with the 571st Bomb Squadron. This was actually his second tour of duty during the Second World War. His first, the first time around, he was assigned to the 21st Bomb Group, specifically at the 398th Bomb Squadron. This is their patch right there, Don, good old Donald Duck. Now what he was doing with that group was that he was flying B-26 Marauders over the Gulf of Mexico looking for German U-boats. And after he completed his tour of duty with them, he immediately turned around, re-enlisted, and was eventually assigned to the 390th Bomb Group. Other feature you can see here is his official name tag. Now, a little bit more background about Howell is that he was born in Orange, New Jersey on May 2nd, 1919, but lived most of his life in Pennsylvania. He joined the Army Air Forces in 1941, where he was assigned to the 21st Bomb Group. And then, after finishing his tour in August 1943, immediately turned out around and re-enlisted, and flew 12 combat missions with the 390th Bomb Group and one Chowham mission. The war ended before he could fly any more sorties. He eventually took a residence in Annapolis, Maryland, where he died on May 29th, 1991. The seventh jacket we have for you belonged to Herbert Hayes Alexander, who was the bombardier for crew number six of the 568th Bomb Squadron. He was born in Lockport, Illinois on April 27th, 1916, and spent his formative years working on his family's farm before he decided to enlist in February of 1942. Now, he initially wanted to be a pilot, but he ended up flunking out of pilot training. So instead, he went to bombardier school and graduated in April of 1943. He was assigned to the 568th Bomb Squadron as a replacement, which, for those who don't know, is a term used to describe people who were sent to a unit to, well, for lack of a better word, replace lost manpower. 1943 was not a pleasant time for the 390th Bomb Group. The group started with 35 planes when they arrived in England in July, flew their first mission in August. By the time Alexander arrived in September, they had already lost nine planes. That's a little over 25%. And out of the around 350 crewmen that came with those planes, a little over 50 were either dead or in a German prison camp. So suffice to say, Alexander arrived at Framlingham at a very interesting time. Fortunately, Alexander managed to complete his requisite 25 missions at that time. He needed to fly 25 missions to get out. And, he re and after he returned stateside, he married Dorothy Miller and became an instructor at the Bombardier Training School in Childress, Texas. He eventually retired from the Air Force with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and returned to Illinois to work on the family farm together with his brother. After the brothers sold the farm in 1968, Alexander and his wife moved to a ranch in Montrose, Colorado, where they lived until his death in 1998. Now there's not a whole lot of detail on Alexander's jacket. Really the only distinguishing feature is this right here. We can't really make out what this says, but we do know what this says. Hell cats. Now, we don't exactly know what it means, but we've been able to come up with a, a good hypothesis of what it means based on what we know about Alexander's service. Firstly, we knew he flew aboard the Roven Ramona, the aircraft, and he flew most of his missions aboard that aircraft. 
Now, given how the word roving means to move around from one place to another, and the term cat was meant was a slang term for spiteful women, we believe that the phrase Hellcats may have been adopted by the crew to suggest that they were flying over occupied Europe with the uh, spiteful Ramona, just causing all sorts of havoc in Nazi-occupied territory. The last check we have for you guys today is the command performance. This belonged to Kenneth J. Wolfert, the radio operator for crew number 25 of the 568th Bomb Squadron. Now, Wolfert was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on August 17, 1920, and married his wife, Dorothy Rose Hauser, shortly after his 21st birthday. A few years later, he enlisted in the U.S. Army and was eventually assigned to the 390th Bomb Group, where he flew 21 sorties between March and May of 1945. His combat tour ended with the cessation of hostilities in Europe in May 8, 1945, and he was honorably discharged six months later. He went on to raise two children together with his wife and died in his birth city of Milwaukee on April 3, 2001. Now, we don't actually have any idea where the name Command Performance came from. There was never an aircraft by that name in the 390th Bomb Group, and even if there was, Wolfer and his crew spent their tour being moved around from plane to plane almost constantly, so them getting attached to any one plane was rather difficult. We reached out to the community on social media to see if anyone could help us figure this out. And one of the people who responded, who just so happened to have been there when this jacket was donated, told us the art on this jacket was added after World War II. So again, like Gerard's jacket, we have another example of a jacket being worn after the war and just being having additional details added on. Again, it's one of those things that shows you just how much these jackets meant to people, that they just kept coming back to them. Now, below, now there are some common motifs on the back of this jacket. First, you see the B-17, that workhorse plane that got these guys home. In the corner here, you can just make out the square J that was the symbol of the 390th bomb group. Right underneath that, you see the symbol of the 8th Air Force, again. Right underneath that, 20 bombs to denote most of Wolford's completed missions. We do not know why he only put down 20 bombs when he finished 21 missions. Maybe he just never got around to it. We just don't know. So the last detail on this jacket I want to draw your attention to is this patch on the front. The Black Panther on top of a falling bomb. That was the emblem of the 568th Bomb Squadron, the squadron that Wolford flew with throughout his entire time with the 390 Bomb Group. That's all we have for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you saw a jacket that you'd like to, to sponsor, you can call us at 520-574-0287, or you can go online at 390th.org and go to contact. Or if you want to follow us on social media, you can follow us on Facebook, you can follow us on Twitter, and you can follow us on Instagram. If you want to become a member, go to 390th.org slash join. Benefits of membership include free admission to our museum, the Pima Air and Space Museum, the Arizona Aviation Hall of Fame, and the Titan Missile Museum, all for one year. You will also get a subscription to our quarterly newsletter, you'll get an invitation to our annual reunion, and you'll get access to special members-only events and content. Now, before I let you guys go, I want to give a special thank you to the members of our staff who made this possible, Amy Serafin, Holly Santoro, and Lori McCoy Forsythe. They really went above and beyond getting this set up, making this, making this rotation just go spectacularly, and I cannot thank them enough. i also like to thank our amazing crew of docents for making this experience, making our museum really special to the people that come through our doors. I also want to give a shout out to the people at Great Projections Incorporated for making the signs for this exhibit, for making the cases. They really did a spectacular job and we appreciate them immensely. And lastly, but certainly not least, I want to thank each and every one of you that came out and, sponsored, and donated to our museum during our SOS campaign. You sponsored our jackets, sponsored the cases. It was, it was really incredible. Sponsored the banners. It was just it was really incredible to see all you guys come out and show your support for our museum. We really appreciate it, and we really hope that we can continue to count on your support for many years to come. So, thank you guys so much for watching this presentation, and we hope to see you very soon. Bye.